screen while I give a brief introduction. Um, so Johan, or Yoshi, came to UBC for his undergraduate studies. Um, he's now in uh, the last year of his PhD studies, I believe, in geophysics with a focus on explosive volcanic eruptions. And so when Yoshi arrived in the Pacific Northwest from New Jersey, he found himself, very understandably from my perspective, uh, falling in love with the Cascade Mountains. Um, and he was constantly wondering how they formed and so decided to study them. Uh, he tells me the Cascade Mountains that form the backdrop of Vancouver were built by volcanism. And when volcanoes explode violently, um, an example is the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, they inject hot mixtures of rock, ash, and gases tens of kilometers into the atmosphere to form these eruption columns. And so Yoshi has been conducting laboratory experiments to simulate these eruption columns. And in doing so has learned that the same physics governing the bobbing of water fountains on UBC campus also govern the periodic collapse of explosive eruption columns. And armed with this knowledge, he's created a new framework for classifying volcanic eruptions that will help volcanologists protect settlements around volcanoes, direct air traffic away from ash clouds, and understand how eruptions influence Earth climates. Um, Yoshi is also described as um, a dedicated science communicator, as showcased by his work as an excellent teaching assistant, his volunteer work giving talks in schools, being involved in events at the Pacific Museum of Earth, and even apparently being interviewed by Bill Nye the Science Guy and the National Geographic. Um, so today Yoshi will share some key results from his PhD research on explosive eruption columns. Thanks Yoshi and congratulations. Thanks Rachel um, and thank you for that very nice introduction. I'm honored to have been selected for this award. Uh, it was totally unexpected and very excited to get a chance to share my research with you guys. So uh, what I'm gonna to talk to everybody today about is fountains from hell. So these explosive eruption columns that occur uh, sometimes every day on earth uh, and the larger ones occurring uh, sometimes every decade uh, and can have major effects on the surface of earth. And where I'm going with this, as Rachel mentioned, is towards a new understanding and really a new classification for these explosive eruptions. Now, I just wanna say, and I guess this is repeating what um, Philippe said about Reginald Brock, a very inspiring force of nature in the history of our department, uh, the first school of nursing, putting women first in a time where that really was rare uh, and people of color. And I think that this quote really does get to the essence and this hasn't been edited. This is, I think, the original. And he's, it says, Brock belonged in that select group of scientific men, today he should probably say people, um, always too small, who seem to take a deeper interest in forwarding the work of others than their own. And I think if more of us try to live by this mantra a, a little bit better, uh, maybe there will be less self-promotion in the world and more promotion of our colleagues and we won't need to self-promote ourselves as much. So something to think about. And a little bit more about me, um, Mark usually introduces me as the irreverent Yoshi, um, probably because I'm from New Jersey, near New York City, a known producer of dirt bags in the world. And um, now my parents here, Alan and Ginny Gilchrist, they are far from being dirt bags. They're some of the kindest people I know. And I hope that I'm evolving into more of a kind, respectful person as they are, uh, as the years go by. Now, I love the mountains. Um, they've shaped my understanding of the world and my trajectory. And as mentioned, one year in undergrad, I didn't really know where I was going to go with a poli sci degree. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to study the mountains because I love them and why not. And another fun fact about myself is I recently was engaged to Manar Al Assad, who's also an alumni from the department of EOAS. Uh, so a happy love story started in EOAS and um, continuing. So. All right, so before I get into the meat of my talk here, um, I just wanna make something clear. I know a lot of people new to volcanoes when they think of eruptions, they think of effusive eruptions like Hawaii or more recently ongoing the Fagra eruption in Iceland. Um, this talk is gonna be about explosive volcanism which is uh, much different. So. Here in Iceland, you may go to have a picnic and watch this eruption and, not, and feel quite safe. Whereas when there's an explosive eruption, you're gonna be running for your life. It's a much different scenario, okay? Um, 
Now, what are the hazards associated with these explosive eruptions? Well, there are many uh, and far reaching, sometimes global reaching. So when you have an explosive eruption, the magma is actually ripped apart in the conduit by the expansion of gas as the magma and the gases rise. So what exits the vent is not uh, lava or lava flow, it's actually a hot mixture of ash, micron sized ash, all the way up to centimeter to meter sized blocks of pumice mixed in with hot gas that are erupted violently into the atmosphere. Now where this erupted mixture goes, either in the atmosphere to spread as clouds or along Earth's surface to spread as these dense pyroclastic density currents uh, is super important for understanding the hazards of these eruptions. In particular, when it spreads in the atmosphere, it poses a great risk for airplanes, something you should think about when you're in an airplane, or actually probably not. <laughs> um, and uh, more globally and longer term after an eruption is stratospheric delivery of ash or SO2 can actually reflect sunlight for years after the eruption. In the case of the Pinatubo eruption in 1991, it cooled the Earth's surface by about half a degree for a year after that eruption. Um, and that's not the biggest eruption that can occur on Earth. So this, this cooling effect can be quite significant and catastrophic actually. Uh, now with the pyroclastic density currents, they're very destructive. If you know of Pompeii in Italy, the Vesuvius eruption there in 79 AD is very famous. One of the first um, eruptions to really be described well by Pliny the Younger and very destructive. Tens of thousands of people lost their lives. You can go there and see the archeological sites of the destruction. Uh, it's fascinating, but humbling at the same time. And PDCs, like what you're seeing here in this image from uh, an eruption of Stromboli more recently, these hot rock avalanches, they're like the snow avalanches from hell though, the hot version. They have all these rocks and blocks and gases flowing very fast, faster than you can drive your car down the flanks of the mountain. And in this case, it's strong belief, they actually flow across water. And they've done this for uh, older eruptions like Krakatau in 1883 and was able to cross a water body and affect some civilizations across that water body from the volcano. So understanding the dynamics of the PDCs, how they interact with water, for example, is super important for predicting hazards from these eruptions. All right, and as I mentioned, air traffic has become a norm of life. Well, once the pandemic is over, it is. I'm assuming everybody's going to want to travel again. And these green lines here are flight paths across the world. And these red triangles are known volcanoes, uh, some of which are active and produce eruption plumes every day. So we have advisories that break the world into sectors, and they're in charge of monitoring where this ash goes. But we need to understand the dynamics of these eruption columns to understand where the ash is going to go to better inform this risk. And if you live in Vancouver, okay, great, best city in the world to live. Oh, it's awesome. It's gorgeous. Um, but don't forget, all, everything around us was built by volcanoes, not always explosive, but in the case of these straddle volcanoes, these really steep sided pointy ones like Mount Baker, they can, they have a history of erupting explosively. And we're not going to, you know, it, it's, there's no indication it's going to happen anytime soon at Mount Baker near Vancouver, but the geologic record shows that this has happened in this region, most recently Mount Meager. Uh, if you take Kelly Russell's course, you may be gone on a field trip to see the deposit there. Okay, so into the science of my thesis, uh, I'm going to present some questions here that I'm going to try to answer with the results. So the first question I'm going to ask is, what deposit features do current eruption column models fail to predict? <clears throat> so when uh, we have an eruption, that hot mixture that goes into the atmosphere forms this eruption column. And the question is, do they collapse or spread in the atmosphere? Uh, and these lead to different deposit features that are distinctive of either of those two fates or a combination of them. Now, what are the physics in the eruption column that govern collapse? How does collapse behave once it, once it starts and how does it evolve throughout the eruption? This is another question I'm gonna to try to answer. And then finally, can we design a new classification for explosive eruptions that is more inclusive than the standard classification that we use and, and more predictive and useful? So what is the classic model for classifying these eruptions? Well, one of these models is what I call the binary model. And in this, you have two fates for these eruption columns. One is the most 
commonly introduced in intro to volcanology courses, this is the buoyant plume model. So when we have one of these explosive eruptions, that hot mixture of ash, gas, and rocks is injected at high velocity into the atmosphere, but it's more dense than the ambient air around it. And it begins to draw in this ambient air, heat it, which expands that air, and it decreases its density as it rises. Now, if it can decrease its density so that that density becomes less than the ambient air before it loses its initial momentum, or its velocity goes to zero, that is, then it can continue to rise as a buoyant plume, now driven by its buoyancy rather than its momentum. It'll continue to rise till it finds a height at which it's happily buoyant, or neutrally buoyant, I should say, and it'll spread as a classic umbrella cloud, which you can see here in this eruption of Mount Etna in um, Italy. So if we go to the other end member regime here, we have the total collapse regime. And in this case, the erupted mixture does not undergo what we call a buoyancy reversal going from more dense than less dense in the atmosphere before it loses its momentum. So it collapses and it collapses as a fountain. And this produces pyroclastic density currents and then Phoenix cloud, which are ash clouds can rise above these and spread in the atmosphere. So these are two very different fates for where the erupted mixture goes when it's erupted. And we really, when we wanna talk about hazards and the construction of these volcanic deposits, we really wanna know which of these behaviors the eruption column exhibited during the eruption. Now for modeling, and we're getting better with these sophisticated computer simulations to model these eruptions, what we need to know is the volume of material coming out and the speed of that stuff as it comes out of the volcano. If we can get those two parameters, what we call eruption source parameters, we can actually do a pretty good job of uh, simulating these eruption columns with sophisticated computer simulations. Now there's a problem though, because there's a growing body of evidence that suggests the majority of these large eruptions, uh, which are called Plinian eruptions, seem to occur actually in the partial collapse regime more than they do in the buoyant plume regime. And this is a thought, was previously thought to be just a short intermediate regime between the buoyant plume and total collapse end members. But more and more evidence from deposits and observations suggests that eruptions occur in this regime, which exhibit simultaneously, so at the same time, this umbrella cloud spreading and collapse producing PDCs, while the source conditions are thought to be constant. Okay, and that's an important fact I'll get back to later. So we don't really understand this regime that well, and a lot of my work is to try to investigate this further. Okay, and then uh, this regime is thought to be linked to these curious deposit features that are, uh, have been observed around Vesuvius, which took out Pompeii, Mount St. Helens, which erupted near here in 1980, Mount Pinatubo, which I mentioned earlier, and almost all of the Pliny and eruption deposits that we've looked at and that are well studied. And the the curious feature of these deposits is that they have these alternating layers of tephra falls, so ash and pumice lapilli, so the centimeter sized pumice falling from the umbrella cloud. It gets well sorted. You can see it's sorted by its size here. And then that alternates with these pyroclastic flow layers where there's poor so sorting and these flow features, it's undulations here. And then that alternation continues higher in the stratigraphy of this deposit, the height meaning uh, throughout the duration of the eruption. So the classic buoyant plume total collapse model would actually predict rapid changing of the source conditions between the buoyant plume and total collapse regime during the eruption to emplace this alternating layering. Now that presents a problem because that conflicts with other evidence from these deposits that suggest the source parameters were constant. And it also places in my opinion, very unphysical constraints on the time evolution of source parameters. So I think this binary model is lacking and I think we need to look more at the partial collapse regime. Now, looking uh, at some of these larger explosive eruptions that have occurred underwater in these sh shallow one kilometer deep water layers or less, we see this striking axisymmetric terracing uh, that was formed by the, erupt the most recent eruptions of Sumizu caldera, which is uh, the Izubonin arc south of Japan, uh, and also around Santorini in Greece. And the, the terraces are here, these shaded terraces that are axisymmetric and regularly spaced, moving away from the source of the eruption here, the vent, uh, 
from both of in both of these um, deposits of these volcanoes. So how can we build such regularly spaced axisymmetric structure in these submarine eruptions? The unknown question is not a satisfactory model that's been put forth for this yet. So those are the questions we're asking that arise from curious deposit features. And the way uh, Mark and I have decided we're gonna try to answer these questions is to use analog experiments in the laboratory where we try to simulate the physics of these eruption columns uh, in a controlled, uh, carefully scaled laboratory experiment. So what we do in ESB in a deep dark dungeon lab, uh, we have this meter cubed water tank in which we set up what we call linear density stratification. So what this is, is we have dense salt water at the base and it decreases in density continuously to the density of fresh water at the top. And we can scale this to mimic the density stratification of the atmosphere. So this sets up our environmental conditions. Then we inject uh, a relatively dense mixture of sand and water as a jet into this tank. And we look at how it mixes with that ambient water to produce either a buoyant plume, a partial collapse or a total collapse column, jet column that is. So we inject it with a constant flow rate because we're interested in seeing if we can produce the partial collapse regime uh, with periodic collapse events occurring, even though the source conditions, the source parameters are constant, right? And we're not modeling temperature effects directly, but we can capture these in part, and I won't get into that in this uh, discussion. So when we run these experiments, uh, we see at least qualitatively, we can capture the main features of each of the buoyant plume partial collapse and total collapse regimes. Uh, and excitingly, we can produce this partial collapse regime where we get simultaneous spreading of cloud layers at height with collapse occurring at the same time and gravity currents simulating PVCs. So it seems that with constant source parameters, you can still produce both features of end member regimes, either continuously or periodically. Now, how do we compare these with natural eruption columns? Well, we use these scaling analyses or these scaling equations. And here on the y-axis, we have the Richardson number. And what this is, it's a measure for the strength of the eruption column or the strength of the sand water jet in our experiments, which are simulating those eruption columns. This primarily depends on the velocity of that mixture coming out of the source, so the volcanic vent or the nozzle here. And as we are here down in this uh, pink regime parameter space, this is the buoyant plume regime where we have very relatively high source velocity, which can drive a lot of mixing and drive the mixture towards a buoyancy reversal so it can occur in this buoyant plume regime. As we go up on this y-axis, we're decreasing the strength primarily by decreasing the source velocity and we occur in the partial collapse regime and then in the total collapse regime up here in blue. Um, on the x-axis, we have the particle volume fraction, so just the volume of the mixture taken up by the solid particle phase. And as we go to increasing particle volume fractions, so more particles in the mixture, we also drive the jet or the eruption column towards collapse here. And for Mount St. Helens in 1980, if you take estimates for its source parameters, you're gonna come up with a range that puts it around here in this parameter space. So occurring in the partial collapse or total collapse regime predicted by these source parameters. And that agrees with observations from the deposit and from the eruption column. All right, and so another big result here from this, from this graph is that what we found is as we vary these source conditions for our jets in the lab, uh, we find that they transition among these regimes smoothly. So if we just vary the source conditions among an experiment just by a little bit, we find that the behavior is shifted a little bit towards the partial collapse regime, say going from here to here. Now that's important because classic models assume an abrupt transition between buoyant plume and total collapse or between buoyant plume and partial collapse. Whereas we're arguing that this is actually a continuous transition during an eruption. All right, so now we're gonna look at a partial collapse experiment and hopefully these videos are working. It looks like they are. So here we can see that in this partial collapse experiment, the collapsing mixtures off the top here of the jet column are not continuous. They're occurring in packages and, and appears periodic. 
And so what we've done on the right is we've differenced the frames of the video. So subtract a frame from the current frame and that highlights motion between frames in the video. What that does is it highlights the sediment wave fronts of these sediment waves. That's what I'm calling these collapsing mixtures here. And you can see them quite well and they appear to be periodic. So now we're gonna to go to a total collapse experiment here. And in these, you can really see the sediment waves easily. You don't even need to look at the video on the right the frame difference one. If you look at the one on the left, you can see the large sediment waves falling from the top um, and appearing as well to be periodic. They are also much larger in this regime and they descend faster. Now the deposit in the total collapse regime is super interesting and exciting because it's terraced. You may remember that terrace deposit I showed earlier. Well, it appears that in the total collapse regime where you have these very large sediment waves, you also have these very distinct axis symmetric terraces in the deposit. All right, so that begs the question, is there a link between this periodic collapse uh, occurring via these sediment waves and this periodic structure, these terraces in the deposit. So what we did next was we measured the tops of these uh, jet columns in the lab because we know that they oscillate and we think that those oscillations are linked to the sediment waves and the deposit architecture. So as we see here on the y-axis, we have height, we have time on the x-axis and throughout the experiment, we see these regular os oscillations, these periodic oscillations of the jet top height. Before each of these dips in the height, we also see a large sediment wave fall off the top. And this is repeated throughout. We see about four of these big dips, four big sediment waves. And we also see at least four distinct terraces in the deposit. So we're taking this as strong evidence that all of these dynamics are linked. That basically you're building packages at the top of these total collapse fountains. And these collapse periodically during the experiment to emplace these terraces in the resulting deposit. So what does this look like if you were to sketch it out? Well, you start to grow a mixture at the top. It wants to descend, but it can't because there's a sustained jet or fountain below it. It deforms because it's still a fluid into this donut structure, a sediment wave that's axisymmetric about the fountain that begins to descend. As it's descending, another one begins to grow, and then that one will also repeat the cycle. And then what I haven't shown here is that when one of these seven waves reaches the tank floor, it emplaces a terrace in the deposit. All right, so what happens if we try to make things a bit more realistic and we add some fine particles to our experiments to make a more continuous particle size distribution? This is more akin to what you would find in an erupted mixture in nature. Well, we find that we get total collapse, we get an initial sediment wave and what looks like some more sediment waves. But as these ash clouds, or sorry, these particle clouds rise above these gravity currents, which are simulating PDCs and rising Phoenix clouds, these rising particle clouds veil the inner fountain column from view. We can only see the top. Now we still see it bobbing at a periodic frequency and we see what looks like the growth of sediment waves. Um, and when we look at the resulting deposit, after the fine particles have settled, we see, wow, look at that, it's a terrace deposit. Okay, so what this, this is important because even when we use more realistic particle size distributions, that doesn't stop the sediment waves from occurring, they still occur and they still emplace these terrace deposits. Okay, get to the next one. Now, what if we go to simulations of eruption columns, these sophisticated computer simulations? This is from our colleagues, Matteo Cerminara and Tommaso Onguero in Italy. They have one of the best simulations currently uh, published to simulate these eruptions. And this is the Calbuco eruption uh, 2015. And here you can actually see sediment waves falling off the top of this eruption column. So whereas I was talking about sediment waves falling from the top of a total collapse eruption column or fountain in the lab, here we have an eruption column in the partial collapse regime. And while we can't really see the momentum driven region here where we expect sediment waves, we can see this top fountain here above the umbrella cloud that is also acting to produce sediment waves. So actually what we're arguing is that in our new updated models in the partial collapse regime, you can have fountain physics governing the lower portion here of the eruption column and also the top overshoot here. And you can measure these oscillations and infer conditions about 
the eruption column just from those oscillations. And you can see here the sediment wave structure in their simulation. So this is promising because we didn't talk to these guys before we made our observations. And then <laughs> sitting around the campfire at Mount St. Helens on a field trip, we both showed each other videos and we're like, whoa, we're both seeing the same thing and we've never met before. So this is promising two independent lines of evidence that these physics, these sediment wave dynamics are playing a big role in governing the behavior of these eruption columns. All right, so let's return to our questions that we're trying to answer. So deposit features, well, I think it's, uh, I'm confident to say that the alternating fall flow deposit layering we saw earlier in the deposits is linked to the partial collapse regime and the production of periodic sediment waves. As well, these submarine terrace deposits, we are arguing are distinct or representative of an eruption column in the total collapse regime where you get the most pronounced sediment waves and terrace structure in our experiments. Um, now the physics governing collapse, it's fountain physics. It's the same as watching a water fountain bob on campus. If you know the source conditions, the source parameters, particularly the momentum and buoyancy fluxes, which I won't define here, but if you know those and form a ratio with those two, you can predict the frequency at which that fountain will collapse. And we're arguing that you can do the same thing with eruption columns. So we've revised the models with these sediment wave dynamics in mind. I'm not gonna get into these. These are quite complicated and involved, but they're profound in that they add a lot more detail to our understanding of these eruption columns in each of these regimes. Now, one important thing is they also make predictions for how these evolve through these regimes. And one of the important predictions is that as the jet strength decreases and you go from buoyant plume, partial collapse to total collapse, the frequency, the speed, and the volume of sediment waves is going to increase. And this is actually uh, observed in many deposits of large eruptions. All right, so some other experiments currently underway. I'm mindful of time, so I'm just gonna blaze through these, but we're trying to investigate the effects of the shallow water layer on the formation of these terraces and also look at source parameters that change rapidly during eruptions, how those affect the dynamics. So we've run some experiments in shallow water layers, and what we're doing is the sediment waves that fall off this subaerial portion of the column, we're noticing that they spread along this sharp density interface between the air and water before they descend to the deposit. What does this mean? It means that you emplace these terraces that are actually wider diameter than you would get if this was a deep water layer or a fully subaerial uh, experiment. So that indicates that the eruption of Santorini perhaps was in a total collapse regime and the sediment waves that fell impacted the water surface, spread a little bit, and then fell to the deposit to produce terraces that are larger than if you didn't have that water layer there. All right, and then with Colin Roll uh, and Mark Jelinek in 2018, we went to observe uh, what we call unsteady eruptions, the Sabancaya volcano in Peru. This is a smaller eruption than the ones I've talked about. And these eruptions are tough to model because the source parameters here are changing very rapidly during the eruption. It makes it very difficult to model. And you can see this here in this Doppler radar data where we're shooting radar waves at the erupted mixture. And that gives us the source parameters in essence, the velocity of the stuff coming out and a proxy for the volume of that stuff. So we can use that to test some ideas on how to capture that time dependence of the source parameters in these more frequent and small eruptions. Okay, and a cool experiment I just wanna show you guys. This is what I call our tulip plume experiments. And here we're really trying to look at how these pulsating source conditions affect the mixing of these eruption column mixtures with the ambient. Uh, so we're, again, we're using analog experiments to test some ideas, uh, hopefully some results to come soon for my defense in uh, late July. And then where is all this going? Well. This old eruption classification is a bit obsolete and also not as powerful as we'd like it to be for predicting behavior and inferring source conditions from deposits. So we're proposing to take that jet strength particle volume fraction regime diagram I showed earlier and turn it into a 3D space with another parameter, the source pulsation number that's gonna capture the effect of the pulsate, the time dependence of the source parameters on eruption column behavior and construct what we call an eruption stability diagram. And this is important because it's going to predict whether or not eruption columns will collapse on the basis of source parameters that we know govern their behavior. 
Uh, and that's a big step forward from this old, older classification system. Um, and so where this can go and how it can be used as well, it can make, first of all, if you know the source parameters of your eruption, you can predict how the clouds are going to evolve and you can predict how the deposit's going to look. Likewise, you can go the other way for ancient eruptions. For example, Yellowstone's deposits or Toba eruption in 73,000 years ago that were considered to be civilization ending eruptions. You can look at those deposits and look for features that are diagnostic of eruption column regime and then use that to constrain the source parameters of those eruptions. And then you feed those into one of these sophisticated computer simulations to see what one of those ancient ultra Plinian eruptions may have looked like. All right, um, that's it. And I'm sorry for going over time, but I'm just gonna leave you with what I call our re recent cotton candy experiment in the partial collapse regime. Just some eye candy for you uh, as I wrap up here. So thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Yoshi. Uh, yes, I recognize we are a little bit over time. So for those of you who need to run off, thanks for staying to the end. But uh, for those of you who can stay, um, anyone that has any questions for Yoshi, please uh, put your hand up or just speak out um, while you're thinking. Maybe I've got one from a from an atmospheric perspective. So it, there's this sense that you're going from this sort of all or nothing regime of it either is a column or it collapses into this middle regime. Does that have sort of implications for how much sulfur dioxide and ash sort of makes it into the stratosphere for some of these eruptions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, this is actually a question that I've been discussing with Thomas Brie and Sam Engwell at Cambridge, because when you have a buoyant plume regime and most of the erupted mixture uh, does not collapse, it rises buoyantly, that's a very effective way of getting it to the stratosphere, right? Um, and uh, the majority of the mass getting it up there. Now, when you have collapse or partial collapse, uh, in the case of the Pinatubo eruption, we saw some of those ash clouds rising off the PDCs, the paraclastic density currents. They actually were able to get to the stratosphere. So they were able to carry some of the mixture that had collapsed up to the stratosphere, uh, despite the fact that it had already flowed along our surface. Now, I don't think there's any estimates that have been published about how much SO2 was carried by those, those Phoenix clouds. Um, so I, that's an exciting research path forward that I'd like to pursue. And actually, <laughs> the goal of the experiment you're looking at here was to sort of get at that question. We wanted to see, can we produce a total collapse and then have the Phoenix clouds rise higher than that sustained column in the middle and to say, okay, you can still have a significant amount of that erupt uh, injected mixture, make it very high up, and then maybe see if we can measure how much of that fluid, which would be the gas phase in eruption, would actually get carried up with those Phoenix clouds. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. I think it's super important too, because these, these civilization ending eruptions like Yellowstone and the Toba eruption, they probably occurred in the total collapse regime. There's a lot of evidence for that. So how much of the SO2 erupted though can still make it up high. And that has huge implications for how much global cooling you get after those eruptions. Awesome, thanks, fascinating. Any other questions? I got one for you, Yoshi. Hey, Zach, <laughs> no, go hey, ahead. Hey, well, when you're, I was just curious, when you're running the experiment, are you, you're controlling like your salt density in the water to kind of change the levels of the atmosphere, but are you changing the temperature of the water or changing the direction of the water in the experiment to toy with currents and, and different sort of, like, outside environment that the, that the volcano is affecting or being affected by? Yeah, that's a good question. So for the temperature part, we're in essence capturing the effect of, of temperature on the density of the atmosphere by using the linear density stratification, right? So um, we're able to capture that. What we're not able to capture is the expansion of air as it's drawn into the eruption column which can work, do a lot of work to decrease the density of the erupted mixture. We sort of capture that because we can tune the density of the fluid that we're injecting in that mixture. And rather than that density of that fluid changing during rise, which it would during eruption column due to the heat exchange uh, with the mixture, 
we're just putting all that density change in at the source essentially saying, okay, let's just put it at the source. It's not gonna evolve as it rises in our experiments. So we're not able to capture the sort of time dependence of those temperature changes. Um, as for currents in the tank, we don't have any ambient currents simulating wind, for example, but that it does have a major effect on these eruption columns and the rise height that they go to and the conditions for um, collapse. And so I've done some other work on the effects of wind. It can also affect the sedimentation. Um, Tomal Bri, who also did his PhD here with Mark Jelinek, has done a bunch of work on that and some experiments where they had a cross flow. Uh, and basically, you can get enhanced entrainment when you have uh, stronger winds. And so the plume height can go be a lower plume height because it reaches the ambient density quicker because of more mi efficient mixing with the ambient atmosphere. Um, yeah. But we do hope to do some future experiments with a cross flow to investigate more effects on sedimentation and what that would do to the deposit as well. Cool, thank you. Okay, so um, I think we'll wrap up here since we're um, a little past uh, midday, but thanks everyone for coming and please uh, join me again in congratulating both Yoshi and Kate on their fantastic achievements and some excellent uh, lectures. Thank you.